You know, I don't care how big and bad Sasquatch can be. This encounter just proves that there is always one force that these giants don't stand a chance against. I'm from northern Texas, and I tell you, if there's one thing that can take down a Bigfoot, it's Mother Nature herself. As springtime rolls around here in Texas, so does tornado season. Every year it reminds me of the once in a lifetime experience that I'll never forget. I'm pretty sure I'm the only person on the planet who's ever had this type of encounter. Whether this was just a coincidence that I happened to be in the way of, or a sign to me from someone or something higher, I'm not sure if I'll ever know. If I didn't have a friend with me, I would have just been convinced that I was tripping on something or something in my brain fried then and there. Maybe too many fumes from the heavy machinery I worked with on a daily basis. But as I said, my friend was with me and he saw the exact same stuff as I was seeing at that moment in time. And he remembers that day as clear as I do. Not surprisingly, how could anyone forget something like that? To give a little context, I'm a construction worker and me and some other fellow crew members were working on a certain back road. Not the major highway like I-40, but one that was fairly busy, enough to need some maintenance pretty frequently. This particular road went through some areas that were pretty wooded for that part of Texas. Throughout the few weeks that we were working at it, we started to notice some peculiar patterns over time going through those wooded sections. The first week going down the road, we thought it was just mere accidents. First day we set to work on it, the road was all clear. But as the week went on, we noticed there were large fallen trees and an ungodly amount of rocks in the middle of the road, right where we'd be working. The trees were understandable. The winds around there tend to get pretty high, and it's typical for branches and all kind of stuff to be blown everywhere. But the weird thing was the rocks. Remember, we're in northern Texas here, where everything is pretty flat so no cliffs or anything towering over the sides of the road, dropping boulders everywhere. So a rock that size in the middle of the road was a very unexpected and strange occurrence when it would happen. And it seemed to happen every day after the first day we started working there. We all thought it was strange and that someone must have been messing around with us. But what we didn't understand is, who had that kind of energy to haul multiple boulders out into the middle of the road and not even care to watch our reactions to it. They were big enough that not a single one of us could lift them on our own, so we took the backhoe we had out there and rolled it out of our way. Every morning we'd come back, there seemed to be more and more of them placed on the road, along with more massive branches and trees for us to remove. It was beginning to become a real burden at that point, and we were getting sick of it. One afternoon, my co-worker and a good friend of mine, Bryce, nudged my arm to get my attention. I looked over my shoulder at him and I saw he was pointing with his thumb at one of the boulders we moved out of the way that morning. I looked closer at it and I saw that there was some sort of writing engraved on it. It looked as if it were a prehistoric petroglyph with some unknown ancient language. I don't know what it was but something about it gave me goosebumps despite it being about a 75 degree day in late March. Weirdest feeling ever. It wasn't chilling in a refreshing way though, that's for sure. Bryce and I pondered what it could be for a while. We came to the conclusion that it was either some sort of hoax or just an accident that this rock happened to get kicked up and be some Native American petroglyph without anyone realizing it until now. Anyways, Bryce took it home that evening because he wanted to take it in somewhere and see if it was the real deal and maybe get some extra cash out of it. After Bryce took the strange stone back, weird things started happening back at his house. Well, first of all, he had to take the whole week off of work because he got so sick he had to be hospitalized. The man just couldn't stop vomiting, and when he wasn't vomiting, it was all coming out the other end, and it just wouldn't stop to the point where he got so severely dehydrated but couldn't do nothing about it because he couldn't keep anything down. It was almost like taking back that strange rock was like taking home some sort of curse for him. Bryce also mentioned hearing some sort of devilish shrieking coming from outside of his house every night since he brought it home, and was always hearing loud knocks at his windows and doors. Things just got so weird around there and he never had the chance to try and get it examined. 
He couldn't help but notice the series of negative events that seemed to correlate with the arrival of the rock at his home. So as soon as he got back home from the hospital, he decided that he wanted nothing to do with it anymore. He tossed the rock in the back of his pickup truck and was driving to a nearby creek to chuck the thing off. On the way there, he just randomly happened to get a flat tire. He had to put the spare donut on his truck just to continue to get rid of the damn thing. He ended up finally being able to toss it down. Wouldn't be surprised if someone drove by that creek now, there would be a bunch of dead fish floating in there. He ended up making it back to work after about a week or so when we were all a little over halfway done with construction. His personality took a complete 180 degree turn after all that, and I was concerned about him ever since. He seemed like he couldn't stop looking over his shoulder and being downright paranoid at all times. He was shedding pounds like crazy, and all of us couldn't help but notice. He always used to have some sort of sub with him for lunch break every single day since he worked there without fail. It was sort of an iconic thing for him to the point where we even had a nickname for him. It was Subway Sammy. But all of a sudden, Subway Sammy stopped eating subs every day, and he seemed like he stopped eating altogether. I mean, that man didn't even have his usual morning coffee with him anymore. You know something's up when you just all of a sudden quit drinking coffee cold turkey like that. We got the weekend off because there were some severe weather warnings, so I decided to use that spare time to head over to Bryce's place to check in on him. I brought with me his favorite sub, a meatball marinara on Italian herb and cheese with provolone and banana peppers. Weird combination, but hey, I don't judge. I was on my way over there and the sky was all dark blue and everything was as still as death. The flat ground glowed almost a neon green, classic tornado weather. I was thinking to myself that the likelihood of a tornado coming around the area was slim. I guess when you have lived in an area that claims to be Tornado Alley, you get used to all of the tornado watches and it becomes like a boy who cried wolf effect. As I drove down the road his house was on, I saw it in the distance, getting closer as I drove on. Next thing you know, I got to his mailbox and pulled into his driveway. First thing I noticed is his lawn was a bit more overgrown than usual. He's one of those people who really loves mowing their lawn. He even does that kind of checkered pattern some folks manage to do with the lawnmower. So that was definitely out of the ordinary for him. I paused for a minute, wondering if it was really a good idea to knock on his door. Maybe the man was just going through something and it was best not to disturb him at the time. But something told me he could use a little help in checking in on. So I took the sub, walked up to his doorstep, and knocked on the front door. When I was waiting for him to answer, I saw a lot of snapped off trees in his yard, and they were arranged in strange ways that didn't make any sense. I wondered what in the world he was trying to do out there. If he was going to build something or what. A minute went by and he didn't answer, so I knocked again, a bit louder. Still no answer. I figured he just really didn't want to be bothered, so I turned to go back down the old concrete steps. To my surprise, I heard the creak of the old rickety door swing open behind my back. I looked over my shoulder, and there he was. He looked like he had just woken up. Oh, hey Pete, he murmured, sort of slurring his words. I could tell he had been drinking heavily. He looked rough. You alright, buddy? I asked him. I held up the bag with the sub in it and said, I got you some grub. He seemed blatantly uninterested, but still thanked me and asked me if I wanted to step inside and have a few beers. Of course I accepted the offer, and I was glad that he did. Like I said, he seemed in rough shape, but I really wanted to help the guy out if he needed it. I went inside and his place was trashed. It really looked like he was letting his life go. Trash wasn't taken out, dishes weren't done, flies were everywhere, and it was all just a real mess. I sat at the kitchen counter that was topped with endless empty beer cans with cigarette buds in them. Bryce grabbed a beer out of the old grimy fridge and placed it on the counter in front of me before grabbing one for himself and sitting down in the chair across from me, and then he let out a big depressed sigh. I asked him what had been going on and if he was alright. He paused and seemed hesitant to respond. The only thing to break the silence was the radio going in the other room, claiming a tornado watch. He eventually went on and said, Things haven't been going well for me lately. I kind of snorted at that and said, Well, I can tell, man. What's going on? He told me that his home had been pretty much a living hell ever since he brought that strange rock back. 
He said that the shrieking never stopped and that they only got worse from there. He explained that the snap trees I saw earlier were from large dark entities that would growl while tearing them down in the middle of the night, and that whatever these giant monsters entities were, they were terrorizing him every night. Honestly, at first I thought he must have been going nuts. I wasn't sure if I believed him at the time. Well, we took a step outside to look at the broken trees, and I'll admit that they looked to be unnaturally structured. And to my shock, I noticed some animal guts staked on some of the broken branches. It gave me the feeling that something wasn't right. And from then on out, I started to believe what he was saying. Out of nowhere, a roaring wind broke the stillness of the air, and heavy rain and hail started plummeting down on both of us. We looked around and realized, across the street in the field, a full-blown twister was making its way to touch the ground, and it was headed straight in our direction. Turns out the tornado watch on the radio must have turned into a warning while we were out there. We both started sprinting in the opposite direction. He happened to have one of those underground tornado cellars, and that was where we were headed. We made it there, and there was a lock on it. He had the key to it out there, placed under a garden stone, but to our convenience, the lock was already popped open. He looked a little concerned for a second that it was already open, because he usually kept it locked at all times, but there was no time to ask questions. We had to get in there ASAP. He flung open the cellar door, and we quickly marched down the stone steps that led into the pitch black darkness that was going to save our lives, and closed the doors behind us. When we got down there, it was real quiet except for one thing, a low huffing and the warmth of heavy breathing on our necks. My limbs felt weak from adrenaline and my heart started racing like frickin' NASCAR. Bryce pulled the string to the light bulb and when it flickered on we saw a grey leathery face with crazy amber colored eyes staring right at us. The thing had large nostrils and an underbite with huge pointed and crooked teeth sticking out. It was crouched down and remaining still like a statue in the corner of the cellar while scowling at us. We weren't sure if this thing was going to attack or what. Bryce and I didn't know how else to react except to stand as still as humanly possible. Like what you do when you see a bear, I guess. But I can guarantee you, whatever it was, it was far from a bear. It had more of a humanoid figure than the figure of an animal. Next thing we know it was snarling at us and growling. So it was a matter of how we preferred to go. Being mauled to death by some unknown humanoid creature that neither of us would stand a chance against, or getting swept away by a tornado. Well, I knew what I felt better about, and that was the twister for me, and I reckon Bryce chose the same fate. We both were slowly backing towards the cellar door, still trying to not make any sudden movements as this creature continued to huff and snarl, while slowly starting to prowl its way over in our direction. One little step at a time we went backwards up the stairs, before finally going ahead and making a break for it. But because of the strong winds, the doors wouldn't budge. We both took hold of each door, one door for him and one door for me, and we slammed our bodies against the doors but they wouldn't budge. The loud noise of the doors slamming seemed to make the creature even angrier. Eventually it lost its mind and started screaming ear shriveling vocals that I'll never forget. I never heard any sound like that before, and I can't think of anything that would ever compare to it. It sounded like a low frequency and a high frequency at the same time, almost like it had two voices in one. It made my ears ring, and I still have tinnitus from it to this day. At that point, Bryce and I decided to just aim for one door, so we both used our body weight to slam ourselves against the left door. It took a few tries, but we were able to squeeze through and finally get out of there. Kind of funny how standing right outside while a twister's going on felt like heaven compared to where we were a few seconds before, but it wasn't over yet. We looked back at the cellar doors, and that thing just swung both of them open like it was nothing, and it was mad as could be. Its hairy body sprinted out of there in our direction, and we followed up by sprinting in the opposite direction towards the house. Rain, hail, and many different objects were getting hurled around us, making it anything but easy to get to our destination. It was hard to see anything at all, and that with the mixture of the extreme wind nudging us around was really nerve-wracking, especially with some hairy giant about twice as big as us trying to take our lives. We clumsily made our way to the front door and frantically swung it open. Before we slammed it shut behind us, we saw the fuzzy silhouette of the beast in the storm behind us become engulfed into the swirling tornado and get swept off its feet. 
He was lifted off the ground and disappeared into the haze of the disastrous weather while letting out one last angry groan. We didn't waste any more time. We went into the closet of the house and took cover there until the storm finally passed about 15 minutes later. And when everything seemed to be quiet again, we got out and took a look at the damage. Fortunately, no windows of his house were broken, but my windshield got cracked by some golf ball sized hail. And as you can imagine, all sorts of stuff was blown all over creation. Branches, trees, trash scattered everywhere. Bryce's mailbox was even blown all the way across his yard. But all these things were the least of our concern at that given moment. We were wondering what that thing was that we saw out there in the cellar, and where did the wind take it? And is it still a concern now, or a threat to anybody else that might encounter it? We searched every last inch of the whole property, and couldn't find it. So we got in Bryce's truck, and went for a drive to see if we could spot it out, and to see if it was still alive, or if we could get a body. We drove down the long road, surrounded by fields, and sure enough, about a half mile down the road, we saw a large heaping mass of black raggedy fur lying still in the middle of the field. We pulled off at the side of the road and observed it while wondering if it was even still alive, and we definitely had our doubts. That fella got flung a long, long ways from home by a mighty force, but to our surprise, he moved. He slowly pushed himself up and shook himself off, almost like a dog. After that, he stood up on his two feet and gazed around at his surroundings. We had a shotgun with us just in case things got ugly again, but it didn't end up being necessary. We were sure that it knew that we were parked on the side of the road watching it, but it seemed like we were the least of its concern. It made its way off into the distance with remarkable speed, but it sort of looked like it had a limp, which was understandable. I don't think it would have been possible for any creature to make it out of that one unscathed. We just watched it go off until we couldn't see it anymore. I said to Bryce that we ought to keep following it, but Bryce shook his head and said, Pete, from my understanding, these things are not to be messed with. We ought to let them be. I looked at him puzzled and I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. What did he mean by that? I beg your pardon? I asked. He explained to me that he had always known that those things were out there and that his grandpa would tell him stories about them, but he never thought he'd experience them firsthand. I asked him what he meant by them, and he called the creature that we had just seen a moment ago, a Sabe, and that there are many more out there. But I later learned that Sabe is just another word for Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Bryce is a quarter Native American, and he has legends from his lineage held dear to his heart, and Sabe just happened to be a major one. He admitted that he had been keeping this knowledge to himself, because he knows how most people react to information like this. They just laugh at it. He said he knew exactly what was going on with that strange rock that he took back a while ago, and that he wanted to bring it to an Indian reservation, and he decided not to pawn it. Well, it turns out that rock was meant to be a warning to us to stop the construction and leave their territory at peace, and the Sabe was angry with Bryce for interrupting their message, and that's why they had been terrorizing him lately. After all I saw, I believed every word that he said and I still do to this day. Bryce is my best friend. He will share with me stories that his grandpa shared with him about Sasquatch, and we have many long and meaningful conversations about life, and how there's a lot more to this world than meets the eye. Whether or not that twister was aligned so our lives were spared from that thing, or some sort of wrath of God onto the Sasquatch, we'll never know. Things became normal back at Bryce's place, and he was his usual self after a few months. But that encounter changed us both forever in some ways. But I think overall, we were real lucky to have an experience with Sasquatch and to make it out alive. Thanks for eating, Smokey. Pete.